Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on Medicare Part D basics and policy options for redesign. I'm Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. The Alliance for Health Policy gratefully acknowledges Arnold Ventures for supporting today's webinar. And now I'm pleased to turn this over to Andrea Noda, Director of Healthcare at Arnold Ventures for brief opening remarks before we get started. Andrea. Great, thank you, Sarah. I would like to thank the Alliance for Health Policy staff for their work on today's event and thank you all for taking the time to join today. As Sarah mentioned, I'm a director on the healthcare team at Arnold Ventures. We are a philanthropy dedicated to tackling some of the nation's toughest problems with evidence-based policy solutions. The philanthropy works on many important issues, including criminal justice reform, higher education, and healthcare. We support research to develop evidence-based state and federal policies and drive policy change through public education, technical assistance, and advocacy. The healthcare team aims to improve healthcare delivery, lower costs to patients and taxpayers, and reduce disparities in access. Our drug pricing work supports research into key drivers of high drug prices and spending. This includes patent abuses and anti-competitive behaviors, market distortions, high launch prices, and unjustified price increases. Medicare Part D cuts across many of these areas we focus on in our drug pricing work. I'm excited to hand it back to Sarah and to today's speakers who will help us understand the complexities of Medicare Part D and why reforms to the program are a critical component of the current drug pricing debate. Thank you, Sarah. Great, thanks, Andrea. All right, we're going to go over some very quick housekeeping items and then introduce our, moder our panelists. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you can join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive and join our community at All Health Policy as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. We want you to all be active participants, so please get your questions ready. There's a dashboard on the right side of your web browser with a speech bubble icon. You can use that to submit any questions at any time during the broadcast, as well as uh, if you have any tech issues you're experiencing, we'll try to help you out. Be sure to check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org, where you can find background materials, including a resource and expert list. And a recording of today's webinar, including today's slide deck, will be made available at allhealthpolicy.org soon. So. Uh, here with me to explore Medicare Part D, its evolution and its redesign as an ex esteemed group of experts. I'm so pleased to be joined today by Lee Purvis, who's the Director of Healthcare Costs and Access at the AARP Public Policy Institute. Ms. Purvis heads the Institute's work on prescription drug and mental health issues. Her primary areas of expertise are prescription drug pricing, biologic drugs, and prescription drug coverage under Medicare. She's a co-author of the Public Policy Institute's annual RX Price Watch reports, which track price trends for prescription drugs widely used by older Americans. And next, I'm pleased to introduce Juliet Kubanski. Uh, PhD, Deputy Director of the Program on Medicare Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation. Dr. Kubanski leads analysis on Medicare prescription drug coverage and related policy issues, including analysis of trends in the Medicare Part D drug benefit program. In addition, she conducts research and analysis related to Medicare spending and financing, financial burden of health spending among Medicare beneficiaries and policy proposals related to Medicare reform. And finally, we have Dr. Stacey Dusitsina, who is an Associate Professor for Health Policy and the Ingram Associate Professor of Cancer Research at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Dusitsina's work has contributed to the evidence base for the role of drug costs on patient access to care and policy changes that might improve patient access to high-priced drugs. She's participated in working group meetings on patient access to affordable cancer drugs hosted by the President's Cancer Panel and co-authored a National Academy of Science Engineering Medicine report on that topic. And on the top of uh, her list of achievements, Dr. Dizazina was recently in inducted into MedPAC. Congratulations. So we're going to launch today's discussion uh, hearing from Lee Purvis, who will be providing a brief look at where Medicare Part D has been, where it is today, and where the program is heading. So Lee, welcome, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. As you heard, my name is Lee, and I'm with AARP's Public Policy Institute. And I have been asked to explain a very complicated program in a very short period of time. So I am just going to jump in. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of where Medicare Part D came from, um, it's actually a relative newcomer. Uh, Medicare itself has been around for about 40 years and Medicare Part D was implemented in 2006. The program provides voluntary outpatient prescription drug coverage, but I feel like that should be in quotes because there is actually a late enrollment penalty. If you go longer than two months without coverage that's comparable to Medicare Part D, you will pay an extra premium or an extra amount onto your premium every month for the time that you are in the program. And that's really just intended to encourage people to have prescription drug coverage. Another really important part of the program is the low income subsidy, also known as extra help, which can provide a lot of help with premiums and cost sharing for enrollees who have limited incomes and assets. The program is incredibly popular. About three quarters of Medicare beneficiaries, about 40 million, 48 million are enrolled in a Medicare Part D plan. Next slide, please. So how does it work? There are actually two types of private plans that provide coverage under Medicare Part D. One is a standalone prescription drug plan that just provides coverage for prescription drugs or a PDP. And the other is a Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan, which provides drug coverage plus other Medicare benefits. Um, the plans have to meet some defined requirements, but there is a lot of variation between plans. Um, you can see a long list here. It's premiums, whether the plan has a deductible, the types of cost sharing, whether it's a flat copayment or a coinsurance where you pay a percentage of the drug's price. The formularies, which drugs are covered and how, utilization management, is there something like prior authorization or step therapy involved for the drug? And then a lot of the plans have pharmacy networks that include uh, preferred pharmacies. So you can actually get lower cost sharing if you go to a preferred pharmacy. So there's a lot of different facets of these plans that frankly can make it a little complicated to differentiate between them. Next slide, please. So how many plans are people evaluating and thinking of all those characteristics? And the answer is a lot. Um, on average, beneficiaries are looking at roughly 60 Medicare Part D plans between PDPs and MAPDs in 2021. Um, thinking about your coverage that you probably have, it's probably a little daunting to imagine trying to look at that many plans on an annual basis. About half of Part D enrollees are enrolled in standalone PDPs and the other in MAPDs. Um, and with a slightly larger number in the MAPDs, which is actually a reversal. Traditionally, we've been seeing more people in PDPs, so we're seeing a little bit of a transition within the market. It's also important to keep in mind that enrollment in Part D is really concentrated. There are five plan sponsors that account for almost three quarters of Part D enrollment. So people tend to be sticking with plan sponsors um, and they tend to attract a lot of the enrollees in the program. Uh, going back to the low income subsidy or extra help, about one in four are enrolled in low income subsidy. So it's a really important part of the program for helping the beneficiaries to be able to afford their prescription drug costs. Next slide, please. So it's interesting, and uh, speaking of all those different characteristics of Part D plans, um, while the average monthly premium has stayed relatively constant recently, there have been some fluctuations, but it's now about $26 per month. But there are actually some seriously uh, different trends, I would say, for some plans with high enrollment. So we've seen some really sizable premium increases since 2006. There are some plans that have seen premium increases of, that have doubled or even tripled since they first came on the market. So there's a lot of enrollees out there that are actually paying substantially higher premiums than what perhaps the average shows. We have also seen a shift towards very substantial cost sharing for some drugs, as that you probably heard prescription drug prices are increasing and cost sharing reflects that. Part D plans can actually charge a maximum of co-payment of $100 or 50% co-insurance for the percentage of the price. Um, that can add up to a lot and we're seeing a lot more plans using that co-insurance across the board for all parts of their formularies. So we are seeing a lot of beneficiaries who are experiencing some pretty high costs associated with their Part D plans. Next slide, please. So the short question is, has this been a success? And I would say from the beneficiary perspective, absolutely. Um, if you compare pre-Part D to current day, nearly 90% of older adults now have prescription drug coverage, which is a huge improvement. And if you look at how the beneficiaries look at the program, they report extremely high satisfaction year after year. I think there is a little bit of a challenge there in some ways. Uh, they are very satisfied, but that may be encouraging them not to switch plans, even when it would benefit them. There are a lot of beneficiaries who are paying higher premiums or higher costs than they would had they taken the time to take a look at the plans that are available to them. Right now, only about 10% of beneficiaries are switching plans year to year. And of course, we'd like to see that higher. Next slide, please. Uh, I think the short question for today is, 
you know, are these good vibes going to continue? Uh, the Part C plan has been successful from the perspective that it provides coverage. But if there's one thing I can leave you with as we kind of jump off into bigger questions about the program, it's to keep that personal perspective in mind. We are talking about a program, but there are real people who are being affected by what's happening within that program. Um, it's really important to be mindful that Medicare beneficiaries really do live on very modest resources. The median income is just under $30,000 per year, and one in four have less than $8,500 in savings. So when we're talking about all these changes and out-of-pocket costs and program spending, please keep in mind that those beneficiaries really are being impacted, and unfortunately, they really are not able to absorb some of the costs that are increasingly coming their way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. And and before you, um, and, and we're going to turn over to Dr. Kubanski in a minute, um, and then we'll get into some follow-up questions. Um, oh, good, good, good. You're back. I wanted to ask you this because just to follow up on your last point before we get to Juliet, thirty thousand dollars and one in four have less than eighty five hundred in savings. And you mentioned the LIS or Extra Help program. Can you share a little bit more? Like, how does somebody qualify for that? How do they know that they qualify? Um, and is everybody who should be getting it, getting it? The short answer is no, not everyone who should be getting it is getting it. Um, and you do have, they have some pretty strict eligibility criteria. So you need to have an income less than less than 150% of poverty, which is around $19,000 for individuals and about 26,000 for married couples and very modest assets. So less than $14,000 for individuals and less than 30,000 for couples. Um, so there, it can be difficult to qualify with those eligibility criteria. And a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of the program, which is another problem. Um, so that's definitely something that I think people are thinking about is how to make sure people are aware of it and then also how to apply, but uh, an underutilized asset. Thank, thank you so much for clarifying that. I'm sure we could do a, another whole hour just on that. So um, great. Thanks, Lee, for that great um, overview. And now uh, please welcome Juliet Kivansky. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, now that Lee has provided um, a very helpful overview of Medicare Part D, I'm gonna focus in on some of the details, uh, specifically the benefit that Part D provides and details about enrollee out-of-pocket spending and Part D program spending overall. Next slide, please. Medicare Part D plans are required to offer a standard benefit or a benefit equal in value. In 2021, the standard benefit has a $445 deductible, followed by an initial coverage phase where enrollees pay 25% and plans pay 75% of total drug costs up to $4,130. This is followed by the coverage gap phase where enrollees used to pay 100% of their total drug costs, which is why it was called the coverage gap. But after a 10 year phase out, provided for by the Affordable Care Act, enrollees now pay 25% in this phase. And for brand name drugs, they receive a 70% price discount from manufacturers and plans pay the remaining 5%. Um, but for generic drugs, there is no manufacturer discount, so plans pay 75% of those costs and beneficiaries pay 25%. When a beneficiary's out-of-pocket drug spending exceeds just over $6,500 in 2021, they become eligible for catastrophic coverage, where cost sharing falls to 5% of total costs. Plans pay 15% and Medicare pays the remaining 80%. This 80% uh, payment by Medicare is also referred to as reinsurance. Part D plans can modify some of these standard benefit parameters. For example, they can charge a lower or no deductible, and they can charge tiered co-payments or co-insurance amounts other than 25%. Uh, one thing to keep in mind um, is that these cost-sharing requirements do not apply to Part D enrollees who receive low-income subsidies. For those individuals, cost-sharing amounts are um, considerably lower than folks who don't receive low-income subsidies. Um, I should also note that this cost-sharing design for Part D covered drugs is unlike that in Medicare Part B, which covers physician-administered drugs, not drugs that you can purchase at a retail pharmacy, which is what Part D covers. For Part B drugs, Medicare charges a flat 20% coinsurance 
although many beneficiaries have supplemental coverage like Medigap or retiree benefits to help pay their cost sharing liability. And unlike Part uh, D, Part B is not administered through private plans. You don't need to voluntarily sign up. Everybody who's enrolled in Medicare Part B automatically has access to drug coverage through Part B. Under Part D, unless you are receiving low-income subsidies, you are required to pay what your plan charges for prescription drugs. And I wanna emphasize the fact that Part D does not have an annual limit on out-of-pocket drug spending. Next slide, please. And because the standard benefit parameters increase each year with the rate of drug spending growth per enrollee, the amount of out-of-pocket spending required to qualify for catastrophic coverage is now nearly two times higher than it was 15 years ago. This is not a problem for the majority of Part D enrollees because most have relatively low out-of-pocket drug costs. Next slide. On average, in 2018, Part D enrollees who didn't receive low-income subsidies spent about $500 out-of-pocket on their prescriptions. But with no hard cap on out-of-pocket spending under Part D, a small share of enrollees face thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket drug costs each year, whether because they take a lot of prescriptions or because they take one or two really expensive drugs. In 2018, just over 1 million Part D enrollees had out-of-pocket spending above the catastrophic threshold, and their annual out-of-pocket costs averaged $3,100, which is about 10% of median per capita income for people on Medicare. Next slide. Shifting uh, now to look at overall Part D program spending, Part D spending was just over $100 billion in 2019, or about 12% of all Medicare benefit spending. Annual Part D spending depends on several factors, including the total number of Part D enrollees, which has been increasing over time, their health status and drug use, the number of high cost enrollees with spending above the catastrophic coverage threshold, the number of enrollees receiving the low-income subsidy, and then plans' ability to manage their enrollees' drug use, such as um, encouraging the use of generic drugs instead of brands, as well as applying utilization management tools like prior authorization, as well as plans' ability to negotiate price discounts and rebates with drug companies, which they use to help lower their overall costs. Federal law currently prohibits the Secretary of Health and Human Services from engaging in drug price negotiations with drug manufacturers. That role is left to the private plans that administer the Part D benefit. Some recent um, cost and utilization trends have helped to constrain Part D spending growth, such as a shift in use from brands to generics, but other trends have accelerated cost growth, such as the introduction of new higher cost specialty medications that are covered by Part D. Next slide. Although only a, a relatively small number of Part D enrollees reach the catastrophic coverage phase, recall that the federal government pays 80% of total costs for this part of the benefit. Essentially, the federal government is subsidizing the majority of costs for high cost enrollees. Back when Part D started, this allocation of liability seemed pretty reasonable when the expectation was that these government reinsurance payments would only account for a relatively small share of total program spending. And in fact, back in 2006, it was only 14%. But now government spending on reinsurance is about half of all Medicare Part D program spending. This larger portion of program spending accounted for by these reinsurance payments is a result of several factors, including an increase in the number of high cost drugs covered by Part D, drug price increases, and a change made by the Affordable Care Act to count the value of the manufacturer discount on the price of brand name drugs in the coverage gap, coverage gap towards uh, the out of pocket threshold for catastrophic coverage. And this change has actually contributed to more Part D enrollees with spending above the catastrophic threshold over time. Next slide. Um, the number of enrollees with um, 
without low income subsidies, excuse me, who had out of pocket spending above the catastrophic threshold started increasing in 2011 and has exceeded 1 million each year since 2015. Next slide. And so on a per capita basis, we are expecting higher Part D spending in the coming decade than we experienced in the previous one, which has implications for Medicare spending overall, as well as for beneficiaries in terms of their out-of-pocket drug costs, affordability, and access to medications, and taxpayers, because income tax revenue goes to fund a portion of Part D program spending. And I think it may um, also lend some urgency to the discussions around policy proposals to lower Medicare prescription drug spending. Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Julia. I'm trying to get my camera back on. I had a, um, a follow-up question for you. You've done such an amazing job really breaking this down for us. Um, so, um, I'd like to ask you uh, actually two follow-up questions. One already came in from our audience and we could have kind of expected it, which is about the new Alzheimer's drug. You mentioned the difference between Part B and Part D. Um, the questioner wanted to know how the new Alzheimer's drug might affect people entering the catastrophic coverage threshold. Um, can, you, um, can you respond to that question? Then I got another one for you. Okay, yes, first question. The new Alzheimer's drug, Aduhelm, will be covered under Part B not, <clears throat> excuse me, not Part D. So out-of-pocket costs for Aduhelm will have no relation to out-of-pocket spending under Part D and won't help people who are covered under Part D transition from one phase of the benefit to the other. So they are completely separate cost-sharing arrangements and coverage arrangements, um, but that's a really important question particularly because the out-of-pocket cost of Aduhelm is expected to be about $11,000 a year for beneficiaries um, in Medicare. Thank you, Julia. And as and as I understand it, we'll also have some uh, ancillary costs from imaging and um, other doctor visits that are not accounted for in the particular price of um, just the medication itself. Um, let me ask um, if if we could go back to the slide that you showed of the the act, the actual catastrophic coverage um, and coverage gap. Um, what I'd like to ask you about is, you know, you did a really great job. Um, just keep keep going back uh, the, the the donut hole slide, even though you didn't use the word um, donut hole as we <laughs> as we used to. Um, I want to talk to you about the trade offs. Um, keep going back, please, to Figure 17. Um, you know, there we go. Um, can you talk a little bit about the trade-offs? Like, what are the different incentives for plans versus, um, you know, manufacturers that are, you know, sort of set up by the way that the um, that the coverage gap is set up? If you could touch on that, um, I know that's a big question, and we can we can get to more of it in the in the discussion. Um, but but we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it's a really interesting question. I mean, if you look at the liability for plans after the initial coverage phase is over, after about $4,000 in total drug costs in 2021, plan liability is considerably less than it was, you know, back when Part D started, when there was no, manu you know, back before the ACA, when there was no manufacturer discount. So, you know, the fact that plans are only bearing 5% liability for brand name drugs, which are obviously the most expensive drugs, once an enrollee exceeds the initial coverage um, limit and gets into the coverage gap phase, and, and then even when they get to catastrophic, plans are only paying 15% of costs. So, you know, plans are in a position where a lot of the cost has been shifted onto manufacturers and then when it gets, then when when enrollees get to catastrophic, um, you know, costs are mostly picked up by Medicare. So that has actually helped keep premium growth in check, which has been good for most people on Medicare Part D who don't have really high drug costs. Um, but it's not really great for program spending, um, and um, it's not really kind of helpful for overall um, out-of-pocket cost affordability in terms of those who have really high drug costs. Um, and, you know, from a manufacturer perspective, they're also really only on the hook for a relatively small um, range of total drug costs with that 70% discount between the initial coverage limit and the catastrophic coverage limit. 
Um, and once an enrollee gets to catastrophic coverage, the manufacturer discount goes away. Um, so I know Stacy will get to this in, in her discussions in terms of Part D benefit redesign, but I think the incentives right now are not great um, from an overall program spending perspective. Certainly the manufacturer discount has been tremendously helpful for beneficiaries when they get to that coverage gap phase because they don't anymore have to pay 100% of their drug costs. Um, but it's created some other, um, you know, poorly aligned incentives that uh, Part D benefit redesign will help to address. Thank you. And we have one one other audience question, so I can't let you off the hook just yet, but promise okay. this will be the last one. Um, all, another question about incentives, and it's, it speaks to this slide. You, you spoke to the differences between brand and generic. Um, and uh, the question was whether um, the brand name discount and the coverage gap is leading beneficiaries and plans to prefer brand name drugs over generics. That's or do we know that yet? As well, you know, certainly from the perspective of, of people um, on average, plans are covering generics favorably to brands. Um, but because there is no discount for generic drugs, um, certainly one could expect that um, plans may, in some cases, prefer beneficiaries to take brands, they get the discount, um, it helps them move through the coverage gap phase more quickly. Um, but, you know, I think the reality is generics are cheaper for everybody, you know, from a beneficiary out-of-pocket perspective and, fr and from a plan cost perspective. Um, and, you know, research that we, uh, that Dr. DeSatina and I have, have conducted suggests that plans do not really preferentially cover brands um, in favor of generics uh, for, the most, for the most part. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Juliet Kubanski. And we will make sure that we um, follow up with you on that particular research as well and, and add it to our, our website um, for our audience, for those who want um, further reading on this topic. Well, thank you so much for setting up that. That was a great overview. And we will now uh, turn to Dr. Stacey Giusettina. Hi, everybody. Um, so after that wonderful set of introductory slides by uh, Lee and by Juliet, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how um, we've been thinking about options for Medicare Part D redesign and some of the bills that have been put forward um, in Congress. So next slide, please. So this has been a very active area recently. Um, and I'll say recently because we're just all going to pretend 2020 didn't happen. So in 2019, there was uh, quite a bit of legislation around this topic. And also in 2021, we've seen some new introductory um, bills. So the, the ones that I'll focus on today are um, a plan that came out of the Senate Finance Committee. This is a bipartisan bill that was spearheaded by Chuck Grassley and Ron Wyden. Um, and, uh, I'll also touch on a uh, Democratic bill led, um, spearheaded really by Nancy Pelosi, but also that had gone through the House and was voted on by the House and passed um, in 2019, that's HR 3. And then HR 19, which is a Republican led bill that um, had been introduced in uh, 2021. And so um, next slide, please. In general, these proposals are shockingly similar despite um, them coming from different committees or um, being spearheaded separately by Democrats and Republicans. So like a lot of agreement between these bills. And in general, they, they seek to do a couple of things. The first is to eliminate the coverage gap. So we'll have another figure, but you've just been staring at the one that uh, Dr. Kubansky walked through in detail. It's complicated. The benefit design has a lot of moving parts, who pays what and when, and it really is very inconsistent. If you think about that patient going into a pharmacy to fill their prescriptions month after month, the fact that your price can change with every fill is not really a great thing for consistency or thinking about people being able to know what to expect and also to be able to take their medications as prescribed. So the bills really seek to simplify the benefit. No more coverage gap. Let's just have something that has a predictable cost for people uh, month after month. 
you know, the other thing that they uh, is a focus is removing uh, the 5% coinsurance in the catastrophic phase of the benefit. So today, Medicare beneficiaries, you know, we have over a million who don't have low income subsidies who went into the catastrophic phase. And in that phase, they pay a 5% coinsurance under the benefit. So that doesn't sound very bad, but if you're taking a cancer drug, that could be, you know, $20,000 is a price that is a typical price for some of the chronically used cancer drugs filled on Part D. That could be about $1,000 a month after you've reached catastrophic coverage. So there um, is an effort to limit out-of-pocket spending for beneficiaries across all of these plans. Um, in general, there is a shift towards plans having a higher percentage coverage, so they're responsible for more spending before reaching the coverage gap, or I'm sorry, the catastrophic phase, and then shifting around those incentives. So some of the discussion before we moved on to um, this set of policy options focuses on, you know, what are plans incentives and what are manufacturers incentives around the current design this, uh, all of the redesign proposals try to shift the incentives to make sure that plans are really engaged in trying to manage the benefit and that drug manufacturers have more financial responsibility for drug spending across the benefit. Next slide. So, you know, again, this is, this is how we're thinking about the benefit under a redesign proposal is really instead of those multi phases that we saw before, we're really focused on a very streamlined benefit from the patient perspective. So 25% coinsurance is kind of the standard benefit design, plans pay 75%. And then you get into the catastrophic coverage phase and patients don't owe any more money everybody has a cap on out-of-pocket spending, and then manufacturers, Medicare, and the plans have different responsibilities than they do today. I'm gonna, we'll jump forward one more slide. So there are some differences by bill, um, so they're not all exactly the same, um, and this just gives you an overview of the way that they're thinking about who pays what and when, when you're looking at the benefits. So the biggest differences I think are HR3 has an out-of-pocket spending limit of $2,000, whereas the other two bills went with $3,100. Now why $3,100? So the, the desire there was to kind of match what would have been the spending needed to get to the catastrophic phase under the current benefit design today if you were using brand name drugs. So this is an effort to kind of keep things as similar as possible to um, what level of spending each of these entities had as of you know the time the bills were being developed. Obviously for patients, lower is better when we think of out-of-pocket spending limits, but we also have to consider, you know, would that create some unnecessarily overuse potentially of some prescriptions or potentially even maybe driving up prices. So one of the concerns about just doing an out-of-pocket cap without doing anything around managing drug prices is that if a manufacturer knows that, you know, after a patient pays $2,000, then it's free to them, there really, you know, is no reason to limit your price. So we have to think carefully about that. Um, Otherwise, we have you know, a little bit of a difference between these bills as far as what percent the manufacturers pay, ranging from about seven to 10% in the initial coverage phase. So they're on the hook for some level of spending during each of the phases of the benefit. That increases for drugs that are more expensive where you have more fills in the catastrophic coverage phase. And that's true across all of these plans. Um, and then what the plans pay and what Medicare pays. So what Medicare pays actually goes down from 80% to 20% in the reinsurance, and that's consistent across everybody. So I guess um, if I want you to walk away with anything today, it's that even though there are some minor differences in the details by bill, these are shockingly similar um, and all kind of around a core mission of 
capping out of pocket spending, simplifying the benefit, and addressing some of the key problems we know that exist with the Part D benefit today. Next slide. All right, so um, again, small differences. I think I just said all of this, but you have it for your notes with these slides after the panel. Um, and I think that might be my last slide. Next slide. Or the end. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. This this was this was really great. And um and and Stacy, let me let me ask you. I think that was an interesting um you know comparison between the the two thousand dollars and and the thirty one hundred dollars. Um, I, I know you are you know you you are studying these things. You're not like working on the hill, but from that from the perspective of how does that then um you know affect the the cost of the overall bill? Um, do you think that that is a factor in um, why why that legislative decision was made. Yeah, I think that's right. So um, one of the challenges is is that these are in a package of reforms. So when you look at the full package of reforms under HR three, even though they have a lower spending cap, they also include drug price negotiation and limits on price increases. So overall, the bill is expected to have a huge amount of savings when you combine those elements. But with the $2,000 cap, there's an expectation that if you only did that, you would see an increase in spending. Um, not, I, I don't think it would be a dramatic increase, but it's still an increase if you only did that component. Um, on the other hand, I think the other drug pricing bills then end up more cost neutral when you're thinking about today, because you know they, that set of reforms included a limit on price increases to the rate of inflation and still found savings. Again, not quite as dramatic as if you also included drug price negotiation. Um, but in general, like we could modify the benefit in these ways and potentially save some money, but likely at least not do too much harm to the budget by making these reforms um, and limiting out-of-pocket costs. The one thing that I'm not sure that has been fully explored is where, like, is there pent up demand that is not currently being met? So we know how many people enter the catastrophic phase of the benefit, but we don't have a great idea of what percentage of beneficiaries don't fill expensive medications that they were prescribed because they can't afford to fill the first prescription. So uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about specialty medications, which are very, very expensive. And so we have some preliminary data showing that, you know, over a third of people who um, have a cancer drug prescription for a Part D drug don't fill it. And so like there could be additional demand that we haven't fully recognized, which could further increase spending. But I think when I think about this from at least just the beneficiary perspective, everybody else's health plan has an out-of-pocket maximum and for Medicare beneficiaries, it seems unfair that you know they are exposed to unlimited out-of-pocket spending. So I think this is something that's well past due. Great, thank you, thank you so much, Stacey. And we we have um, already some great audience questions coming in. So I'm going to invite the rest of our panelists to come and join us. Um, and while they're doing that, well, there was an interesting question. Um, speaking a little bit to, to to your point about like what do consumers do, which was you know, if someone is prescribed something under Part B, you should, you know, like an infused, you know, can they ask for the, the pill version? Of course, there aren't um, pill versions of all of these different kinds of medicines. So, um, you know, is that something that is a tactic that, that people can use or, or should use? I think there are a few examples where that that is possible, but by and large, it's kind of an either or, you know, like, the coverage is happening under Part B or it's happening under Part D. I think in some clinical scenarios, like in uh, rheumatologic diseases, or um, that maybe you have a little bit more choice and a couple of drugs that have better coverage under Part B. So I think there is a little bit of navigation, but by and large, it's like, if you need this particular drug, it's covered under one part of the benefit and not the other. Um, you know, maybe one of the other panelists can speak to appeals processes. That's another thing that can be used, like if your drug isn't covered. But one of the problems is, is like 
a lot of these drugs are covered, but they are just expensive. So it's like you're getting coverage, but maybe you just still can't afford the price that is you're facing when you have to fill it. Great. Yeah, Lee, I don't know if you have any thoughts from your from the consumer perspective um, about how people navigate all of this. I think the challenge is that they aren't, and that's kind of where our concerns are coming from, where we are seeing and hearing from members who are finding themselves in a spot where they simply cannot afford the drug, they don't have an alternative, and so oftentimes they're going without, um, or they're really having to make those tough decisions between paying for that drug that they need or paying for things like their rent, and that really is not a position we think anyone should be in, so, you know, it really is an issue that unfortunately there aren't a lot of solutions to beyond trying to address the root of the problem, which is what we're discussing today. Great, thank you. So, um, Dr. Yusitsina, you you had mentioned some of the other um, you know aspects of the the the, the bills, and you you said you know you talked about negotiation. Of course, that's been a very um, big point of contention. Um, can you speak to how that is addressed in the different proposals? And then I want um, Julia to weigh in as well. Sure. So um, not much. <laughs> and HR3 addresses it very directly and includes um, international reference pricing as their mode of drug pricing um, and drug pricing reform. So negotiating and getting prices that are similar to other countries, which would be expected to dramatically reduce what we pay. Um, that translates into lower costs for beneficiaries because if we're paying much less for the drugs and people are paying a percentage of the drug's price, like that automatically reduces what the beneficiaries would have to pay for many of their drugs. Um, the other bills really, um, HR3 also includes a limit on price increases. So like that is something we have in Medicaid, but we haven't had in Medicare and I think would be very welcome. So the Senate bill also includes that drug price increase, like limiting it to inflation. So for existing products that are already covered, that's great, you know, we slow the growth in the price. One of the challenges is, is that if we aren't doing anything about the price, then companies can very quickly turn around and raise their price to make up for the fact that they can only increase the price by inflation now and not by whatever amount they want. So um, I I was in a big meeting and we you know I heard from industry members when the coverage gap discount jumped from 50% to 70%. They're like, oh, we immediately renegotiated all of our contracts. So I think there is a real risk that you know. If we do only one thing and we don't do other things to try to make sure that the prices can't just go up to compensate for those losses, then we should just expect to still be paying more. <laughs> so it's like a, um, I always say it's like whack-a-mole, you know, like it's gonna, mm -hmm. they're gonna maintain the profit levels um, as much as possible. Thanks, any other comments on that question? Yeah, and, and obviously a huge point of contention, right? With 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 then you know sort of the counter counter argument that um, imposing such draconian um, you know changes to the prices would would influence um, R and D and and innovation. I know we're not going to have a lot of time to get into all of that today, but um, but certainly that's been one of the um, other uh, other pieces of the puzzle. I think one of the things that um, has been interesting over time is, um, and I think this was a letter from Republican members uh, after drug pricing reform kind of got tabled, you know, in, in 2019 as, you know, that, that basically we have a Part D redesign that is very sensible. We have a lot of things we agree upon. We could do something bipartisan in this area. And I think that's something important to hold on to is, you know, like drug pricing reform is a big topic. Medicare beneficiaries right now have real challenges with affordability that should be addressed. And if we can't get both together, we should still not, you know, throw this out because we can't get an agreement on, you know, the level of drug pricing reform. It's like, this is still important independent of those other things. 
it's just we should recognize that some of the changes we make could potentially make it even more challenging with you know drug spending but those topics can also be tackled yeah, I, I would echo um, what Stacy said. I, I think it's, you know, when you look at the different policy proposals in HR3 and HR19 and the Senate Finance Committee all um, from a couple of years ago, there's not, you know, there's some common ground. Part D redesign is a feature that runs through all of those um, proposals. And I so I, you know, I think it's important to to consider why that's the case. You know, Medicare beneficiaries don't have an out-of-pocket cap on drug spending, and that's unlike any other, you know, insurance product out there um, in the commercial market. Um, and you know, we're talking about a population that has, you know, a lot of chronic conditions, and Part D is increasingly co covering high-cost medications that weren't around 15 years ago when Part D started. So, you know, as, as Stacy said in her remarks, you know, that 5% coinsurance in the catastrophic coverage phase seemed pretty reasonable when we had drugs that cost, you know, maybe $1,000 a year. But now we have drugs that cost $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And that's just such a, you know, remarkably high number that you know, for any of us to have an unlimited um, liability for that medication during the course of the year could, you know, could break the bank. Um, and and we're talking about a population that has, you know, median income of, of thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So the that the fact is that you know the the Part D benefit doesn't quite look like it should for the pharmaceutical marketplace that we have today. Mm. And, you know, policymakers can disagree about drug price negotiation and inflation rebates, but if they can come to agreement on Part D redesign, that seems like a really important thing to focus on and, um, you know, dealing with maybe some of the consequences um, after we've provided assistance to beneficiaries in the form of an out-of-pocket cap. Mm. Yeah. I would say to, Juliet's point, um, you know, obviously it's incredibly important to make sure that beneficiaries have access to the drugs that they need in an affordable way. And that is, you know, driving our interest in ensuring that there is a hard out-of-pocket cap under Medicare Part D. Um, but on the other hand, the other side of the coin that we really can't forget is the fact that prices, high drug prices and price increases really are what's driving what we're seeing under Medicare Part D. So if we don't address that part of the problem, we really are just kind of kicking the can down the road. And it's really kind of behooved everyone to address both sides of the problem because the reality is we wouldn't be seeing what we're seeing under Medicare Part D if drug prices weren't doing what they're doing. So finding a way to address that is also really important. Yeah, and 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 um, and there's a good um, follow-up question here, and Lee, I'll, I'll I'll turn to you for this one. Um, which is uh, the question from the audience, do you believe the frequent focus on premium costs, which are low in comparison to cost sharing, are um, causing unnecessary challenges to, um, you know, the cost sharing issues that you mentioned? And, you know, this person specifically asked about the serious life-threatening chronic conditions. Ju Juliet, you presented some data earlier about, you know, like the average spending and that it's it's the usual, as in health policy, right, the small number of people has the, the high, um, high costs. You know, Lee, would would any of these proposals um, address that and and actually help people with those um, much more serious conditions? I think the expectation is um, going back to the original question about premiums and the focus on premiums. I do think there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that premiums really haven't changed a whole lot and they aren't that expensive. Um, but like I mentioned during my presentation, if you dig a little deeper, you do see some people that are paying $80 a month for the prescription drug plan. Um, so those premiums do actually get a lot more expensive than what you potentially see on an average. Um, and I do think, hopefully, to the extent that any redesign efforts include efforts to address prices, that's where you really start seeing the changes in cost sharing, especially to the extent that plans are relying on coinsurance, which is actually just a reflection of the drug's price because it's a percentage of the drug's price. Um, to the extent that you can get those prices down or at least not growing as quickly, that will have a meaningful impact for beneficiaries who are facing that high cost sharing. Um, going back to the original point, you wanna make sure that, that program spending is you know, not increasing. You wanna make sure that out-of-pocket costs are not increasing, but it's going to take a, a, a lot of different approaches to make that happen. Um, so complicated problem, but I do think we have some solutions. 
Sorry, can I add on to that? I, yes, I, I think this premium question is really important because we have seen a trend um, where you know premium, the average premium has been you know relatively consistent, hovering around thirty dollars or so. Um, but I think, as Lee said, underneath that there are some m more interesting trends in cost sharing that could have a more meaningful impact on beneficiary out-of-pocket spending. Um, plans have been increasing the deductible that they're allowed to charge, so the majority of plans now charge a deductible. Um, and plans have also been switching to using coinsurance, particularly for non-preferred drugs. Um, and I think if people are focusing on the premium as a measure of overall cost, it's inadequate in terms of understanding a beneficiary's total liability. But it can be really hard as a person trying to choose a Part D plan to understand what your total costs will be. And if you're only focusing on the premium, then you may be really missing the more important part of the story, which is, are your drugs covered by the plan that you're enrolled in? What formulary tier are they placed on? Um, and what's the plan charging? And what pharmacy do you go to? And is that a preferred pharmacy? Because you may pay more if you go to a non-preferred pharmacy. So there are several levels of cost involved in a Part D plan. And in comparing, it's really important to look beyond the premium to, um, to understand more about the other costs associated with coverage. Um, and what's happening with those costs in our analysis, we've seen plans charging higher costs, um, as I said, particularly for non-preferred drugs. So um, while it's an, an individual decision and some people might be you know, better off in a cheap plan, that is definitely not the only important, not the most important thing that people need to be considering in, in evaluating um, their different party plan options. Great, and, and and there's some great audience questions coming in, and we've got eight minutes left, so I'm going to accelerate the pace a little bit. But one another one basic one came in that I want to make sure we really address again. When is Part B used for medication versus Part D? And then again, like if we go to the, you know, you're picking a Part D plan. I mean, do pe people even like know the the difference? Oh, some drugs might be covered and some may may not under this plan. Um, so so um, Julia, since you were you were speaking, can you just Give us the, the short um, snapshot, and then again, we can add um, resources to our list for folks who want to read more. Sure. So really briefly, Part D covers outpatient retail prescription drugs. So the drugs that you get from the pharmacy, you know, from CVS or Walgreens, that if you go to your doctor, doctor writes a prescription, you take it to the pharmacy, you get a pill, you swallow it. That's generally what Part D covers. On the other hand, Part B covers drugs that are administered by a physician. You go to a hospital outpatient department if you need um, chemotherapy or um, you know, some other um, condition that requires a drug to be injected um, or infused. Those drugs are covered under Part B. Great, thank you. All right, we have a couple of really wonky ones, so we're gonna just go go to those. One of them was specifically for, for you, Cece. Um, um, these redesign options have a potential unintended consequence on Part D EGWPs. Doesn't Medicare want EGWPs to keep their plans or just go on the open market? Over 7 million folks on EGWPs with a cost to Medicare of $3 billion if they go on the open market. Can you deconstruct that question for us a little bit? Um, <laughs> try, to, <laughs> try and answer that, um, and uh, we'll see if others want to weigh in. I saw that question and I thought, gosh, I hope Juliet knows the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess um, my, I, I'll say my gut reaction. So my gut reaction is like the employer group waiver plan. So it's like when you get your benefits through your employer and uh, you get a payment to to basically stay off of the Met, off of Medicare Part D, the individual plans, um, your employer does uh, to subsidize your coverage. So. My impression has been that there has been a trend away from these over time. Um, so employer-sponsored retiree drug benefits have, have gotten less, less and less popular over time with employers as, as they kind of moving their employees off into the, into the Part D plans individually. I would assume that, yeah, Medicare redesign probably could push more people into the traditional program, into the standalone plans or Medicare Advantage if employers saw them as a 
dramatically higher costs? Uh, maybe, but I, I guess, Juliet or Lee, if either of you know more about the employer group waiver plans, kick, kick it in. <laughs> I guess I would just say, you know, I'm not sure. My sense is that Medicare may be agnostic as to whether a beneficiary is in an employer group waiver plan or in a standalone or Medicare Advantage drug plan. I mean, Medicare is subsidizing coverage uh, under both, you know, under the AGWIPs as well as, you know, the basic standalone PDPs and the MAPDs. I mean, I think the main concern is making sure that these beneficiaries continue to have access to drug coverage. Um, at whether they're in an employer group plan or a standalone PDP or an MAPD. To some extent, they might be better off if they were in a standalone or Medicare Advantage plan because they could actually then choose their coverage. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the egg whips, if that's what your employer offers, that's what you get unless you decline it. And, and then you're declining everything that your employer is offering in the, in the form of retiree benefits. So, you know, some people may be better off if they're able to kind of go into the open market, if you will, for other Part D plans. Yeah, um, and I, and, and sorry to cut you off, but I, I want to just get to a couple other questions, but it, it does point to an interesting um, question, right, which is like, will any of these Part D redesign uh, proposals, would they, if enacted, like, alter anything outside of Part D on the commercial market or what have you? Um, that might be a, a question for another time, but I'd be curious if, if anyone has any quick, like, immediate reactions to that. You know, I think that maybe, I, I guess maybe going back to the employer group waiver, you know, like my my impression is, is that they can be a little bit more generous, especially during the coverage gap where a beneficiary would go from a copay to a coinsurance. This is, uh, there was a recent paper showing this for insulin. So where the insulin coverage under employer group waiver was more like a flat copay for every single fill versus this disruption where you pay coinsurance at some point. So like, by simplifying and streamlining the benefits so there are not so many phases, it may actually mean that employers will look at that or other, you know, systems look at that and go, okay, well, that's that's better. But I, I think that the redesigns really just aim to fix a lot of internal problems to Medicare while keeping things as cost neutral as possible. So I'm not sure about the, there would, would be a lot of negative spillovers onto other payers. Great. Let me, um, we're, we're going to have to close, unfortunately, uh, but I'll, I'll ask sort of one final question for each of you, which is, uh, and we're just going to focus on Part D redesign. Um, you can feel free to add on to that. Um, do, this was from the audience. Do the existing proposals provide enough enhancement of patient affordability? What are the other things that would improve affordability? So, um, you know, I guess I'll throw in the, and how do we know? So, <laughs> um, why don't we go in, uh, in uh, that's just the speaking order we started with. Lee, uh, would you like to kick that one off? Sure. So, I would say to the extent that there is a hard out-of-pocket cap, which I think all of us have just been hammering on, to the extent that that exists, that's a huge improvement. Um, to the extent that drug price trends are moderated by the redesign, um, what's included in the redesign, that is a big one for beneficiaries as well. Um, there also have been some parts of the redesign efforts that would allow beneficiaries who, for example, blow through the benefit on the one fill, which is actually 10% of people who hit catastrophic, they have one fill and they've already hit their out-of-pocket max. Um, that's a lot of money for people, particularly who are on fixed income. So the idea of finding ways to spread out those costs so they aren't facing several thousand dollars in January, um, it would also be an important improvement. Um, and then to the extent that we can encourage people to um, focus perhaps on co-pays a little bit more than co-insurance and incentivize that sort of plan behavior, I think that would be a big important change as well. Great, thank you. Dr. Kansky. Yeah, Lee's last point is one that, that I was gonna mention. You know, the, the trends that we've seen in terms of uh, benefit design with um, an increasing use of co-insurance mm -hmm. is, um, is hitting people, I think, harder than, you know, these flat dollar co-payments, obviously, that are easier to understand. Co-insurance, you really only understand what your out-of-pocket cost is if you know what the underlying price of the drug is. And then, and that's something you may only realize when you get to the pharmacy counter. Um, so I think encouraging plans or, you know, whatever CMS can do to maybe um, put some kind of requirements around um, using co-payments for generic drugs and limiting generic um, placement on non-preferred tiers where there are co-insurance requirements. Those are kind of wonky things, but those really do matter um, in terms of beneficiary out-of-pocket cost. 
Great, thank you. And Stacy. Yeah, we covered it all really. I would say um, completely agree about co-pays over co-insurance. We have done work showing how the redesign could actually increase spending for someone using something like insulin relative to day, today's benefits. So like not harming people who are lower spenders while trying to add the cap would be really important. But I think the spreading out the cost of that first high fill, you know, like we know people will leave their drugs behind if the cost is too high. So like if we could take that first, you know, if the cap is $2,000 or 3100 don't have the person hit that with a single fill, like maybe do a monthly cap in addition to the annual cap. And then that could maybe help constrain not overdoing it on spending later. So if you broke it up at $500 a month or something as your limit, that could help uh, slow down spending overall and make it more manageable. Thank you, a great point to end on. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because you, you know, the, that picture of someone leaving the um, prescription at the pharmacy counter, at the end of the day, the whole reason why we do this is, is uh, you know, presumably to improve people's health, right? And um, and so we've talked a lot about dollars and cents and benefit design and so on, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's like taking it to the next step of what impact will this ultimately have um, on health. So uh, thank you, um, each of you. It's been a, it's been a, an enlightening conversation. I hope it's been helpful to our audience. Of course, uh, please check out our website, allhealthpolicy.org, uh, for uh, the materials from this conversation. Fill out the evaluation. We really do use it. We're all about continuous improvement. Um, Next, save the date uh, for our Signature Series Summit on Health Equity. We're really excited to present that to you. And coming soon will be our Health Policy Handbook, your um, easy peasy guide to um, some important core topics in health policy. So Dr. Stacey Justina, Dr. Juliet Kabanski, and Ms. Lee Purvis, thank you today for joining us today. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Great.